Hello. Hello. Are you guys ready? Yeah, I think we're ready. Okay, because I, I know it's hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a, a system set up, so I'm not like right in front of the microphone. So okay, 
I'll do my best to speak up with questions. <laughs> yep. Or just type them in, just type them in chat if you get questions. So sounds good. Okay. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Catherine Wisner, and I'm with the University of Wyoming, Laramie County Extension Office here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And I feel very honored to be able to teach this class to you all today. And I'm sorry I couldn't make it, but I'm also I'm in the middle of the Master Gardener program, getting ready to start up the Advanced Master Gardener program. And a couple weekends from now, I'm going to do the Wyoming Bee College Conference and Garden Market Conference, which is a really big to do for me at least. And to complicate my life, I also raise sheep and cattle, and I am in the middle of lambing. So there's no way I could escape and come up to beautiful Washakie County and as much as I would have liked to have done that road trip. So anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, okay? Behind me in that picture, that is my high tunnel. That is when it was um, 26 by 48 and I lengthened it to a full 100 feet. So you can see behind me, you can see some brown things hanging off of a trellis. Well, those are watermelons. I also had um, artichokes growing in here, peanuts, sweet potatoes, um, basil. I, I had a 50-foot row of basil. <laughs> what was I thinking, right? What was I thinking? <laughs> and, and I've got... Um, I'm trying to get out of your way. Row of carrots and peppers, and then I have uh, tomatoes. So I grow direct into the ground in my high tunnel. I don't do it pots or raised beds. And, and granted, this is a bigger high tunnel, but it's easier to manage the soil. And that's huge. That's a huge issue. And I get in there, well, my husband gets in there with the rototiller and he gets to do two laps and that's it. But I grow everything up, so you can see behind me, that's a flexible cattle panel arch. So if, it can, if it's viney, like a tomato, or watermelon, or cucumbers, or cantaloupe, or any of those viney things, they grow up. They don't, I don't let them suck up space. And then underneath this tunnel, I'll pack in more uh, vegetables, more carrots, beets, lettuce, whatever. And so every little bit of space is utilized. I've got um, onions over here. And again, uh, what was I thinking? That's all basil. And then that's all basil too. This is, this is a lot of basil, a lot of pesto. So, so high tunnels are really magical places to grow in and you can grow a lot in a little space but you've gotta be very, very careful how you manage what you're doing in there. So this class, I'm gonna bust a bunch of myths and hopefully get you on the right track to be very successful. And I have to thank a couple other ladies before we get going, um, Dr. Karen Panter, who is since retired, and Dr. Laura Potroff, who is also retired. They taught me a lot, a lot about growing in high tunnels. I also took a lot of classes conferences. I, I traveled all, down to Mississippi to take a high tunnel class of all places. So don't stop learning about these because it, it's changing. So with that, I'm going to share my screen with you all. And I'll start at the beginning. Okay. And Every, Stephanie, everyone can see this? Um, yep, it's Amanda, and I think we're good. Amanda, okay. Yep. You're coming up as Stephanie on my computer screen, so. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Okay, so I, I'm going to go from a premise of, of, I'm not sure what you know. So I'm going to start at the beginning. So the definition of high tunnels and hoop houses, the term is interchangeable. They are kind of a covered greenhouse, but use a different, and this is important, different set of growing technologies. In their purest form, they are considered non-permanent structures because they lack electrical service or automated ventilation or heating system. 
The whole point with a lot of this is to beat the grocery store price, right? We're trying to beat grocery store or we're trying to sell our vegetables. So we have to keep our costs or overhead costs low. And as soon as you start adding electrical or automated ventilation, your, your cost to run this goes up and heating systems, you cannot afford. I'm just gonna tell you right now, you cannot afford to heat the, a high tunnel or hoop house, much less a greenhouse because that's, that's a pocket buster. So typically covered in a single layer, maybe a double layer of plastic, season extenders, cold climates, and protection from the elements in warmer climates. And so they use a lot of high tunnels down in Mississippi and Louisiana. And a lot of the times they're actually blowing cold air through it, but they grow predominantly in their version of winter. So what are you gonna be growing? Are you going for yourself? Are you going for farmer's market? And, and I gotta tell you, if you're thinking about the farmer's market, they, every farmer's market is begging, begging for more vegetable growers. You would do very well selling at a farmer's market your vegetables. Size of your greenhouse, measure first, build second. <laughs> My first high tunnel was a very humble 20 by 14. I planted it, walked into the house, looked at my husband and said, I just outgrew the high tunnel. He didn't think it was funny. And the next one was 26 by 48, which is the one behind me. And I was growing for the farmer's market and I was growing for um, community, um, CSAs, so I was selling shares. So I morphed it up to a full hundred foot. And, but I had the site to do it. So measure first, build second. And I staked the site out. I stood inside the stakes, I roped it off, I walked it and it's like, am I comfortable in this space? So that was, that was part of the adventure there. And then do a site analysis. Believe it or not, having trees or shade on the west side in the afternoon to block that heat can be really important. And, and so it's not heating your high tunnel, it's cooling your high tunnel is the biggest challenge. So water quality, if you're on city water, your public utility company will have water tests and it'll be able to tell you what that water is. If you're out in the county on a well, you absolutely have to get your water tested and specifically for E. coli, for fecal chloroforms, your county lab, if you've got one, should be able to do that for you and it should do it at no charge or very inexpensive or lab here in Cheyenne will do it for $10 a water sample. If you want a really good water sample, where you know what the pH is, the salt level, the EC, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium levels, then you've got to send it out to a lab. Always, always send your samples to as local lab as you can find. So construction methods, build, build your own or a kit. Either way, I will have pictures of both methods. Type of covering, do you want plastic, poly, glass? I, I don't know about y'all, but down here in Laramie County, we have hailstorms that are biblical. So I don't ever recommend hail or uh, I don't ever recommend hail, but I don't recommend glass because if it breaks, you have a mess that's, that's scary. So the story, my story on, on the glass, there used to be a lot of commercial greenhouses down in Arvada, Colorado. And they grew carnations and roses and supplied the floral florist market in Denver. Big hailstorm came through and it was all glass greenhouses and it wiped the industry out just in a heartbeat. So I'm, I, I'm really kind of on the fence with glass and I know people can get storm windows and all that sort of stuff for free, but just be super careful. And again, cooling your greenhouse is a bigger challenge than heating it. Greenhouse insurance, okay. I've never been able to get it on my homeowner's policy. They just sort of look at it and go, well, it's, it's a non-permanent structure. We can't insure it. 
but yet the county assessor goes, oh, look, you have a structure. We're going to tax you. So <laughs> there's kind of a conundrum there with that. So just kind of a heads up on that. If you build a big one, you may or may not be able to get insurance on it. Okay, location, location of your greenhouse. In a perfect world, you're going to line your greenhouse up so that it's on a north-south axis. And you want it perpendicular to the prevailing winds. And part of it is for ventilation. I know that seems kind of counterintuitive that you'd rather put the back end into the wind so it has less um, exposure, but that's really not the case. You want that wind, so down here in this lower picture, you want the wind to go up and over, just like a windbreak, just up and over that. And then you have this, the lee side, which is gonna be the calm side. And this is where you can put in plants that need more protection. You know, your fussy grapes or fruit trees, apple trees, cherry trees, plum trees, that sort of guys can all go in on that calmer side. Or maybe you have more of your garden over there on that calm side. So in a perfect world, this is how you want to line it up. And also for sun exposure, in the summer, your sun is going to be coming up kind of at this angle and it goes overhead, and so you get a lot of sun exposure. The same thing in the winter, you're gonna have some shade areas, some shadow areas in the back, but you have areas where you can grow year round in a high tunnel if you want to. Okay, the greenhouse structure. The frame, whatever you build, has gotta be able to withstand a snow and wind load and any other live load. So some of those other live loads, I've seen a lot of people hang things from the purlins in their high tunnel or from the top, very top purlin. And so that's also another type of a live load. So you've got to be able to make sure that it can withstand that live load. My high tunnel, I've had a foot of snow on top of it and it did just fine. So types of material, types of covering. You got the polycarbonate panels, typically a 10 year warranty on them. They're, they're really best for end walls because they're not, they're, they're not flexible. But if you have a high tunnel or greenhouse type structure that's angular, like the one in the picture, it works out fine. But don't forget your ventilation and the top vents up here is not enough ventilation for the high tunnel or the greenhouse, it is not enough. And if you have to start bringing in fans, there's your electrical bill. And, and so keep in mind what your costs are and if the costs are important to you or not. Polyethylene film, this is probably hands down the most popular, easy to get, easy to work with. It comes in six mil and 12 mil. There's a 12 mil that's woven, it's made by Soul Rig. And I think, I think um, oh, there's another company that makes a, an 11 mil woven. But the, the words that I get back from other people out in the field is that they like that 12 mil woven. You can also put a six mil polyethylene film on top of that 12 mil and really get some good product, you know, protection. However, it impacts your light transmission. And that becomes really important. When you don't have that light transmission coming through, it changes the nutrition requirements of your vegetables. They're gonna grow longer, taller, so they get leggy, they're stretching for the light. And that nutrient, that NPK requirement changes. So you have to be real mindful of what you're putting on is gonna impact what's inside. I've been using the 12 mil for, well, mine's been on there now for, well, I just replaced it. I had, I had a two six mil on my little high tunnel and it lasted me for almost 18 years. It, it was incredible. It turned milky white, light transmission was really bad, but it worked out. It, it, was, it was pretty economical. It absolutely, whatever you buy has got to have UV protection. If you buy the cheap stuff at the hardware store, it won't have this UV protection. It will only last you for a couple of months before it breaks down and falls apart. So, so spend the money up front, get the good stuff. Okay. 
So what you do or don't do will have an effect on your production. And so this is gonna be a lot of myth, bust, myth busting <laughs> for growing in a high tunnel. So one of the biggest myths I run into is that the high tunnel has gotta be hot and humid. Couldn't be farther from the truth. So have thermometers in your high tunnel. Those thermometers should be down where the plants are growing, not at your head, but you want them down. Mine are right on the ground. Some of them are up maybe 18 inches, but not much higher than that. In my tomatoes, I'll put them up a little bit higher as they grow, but I want to know what that temperature is in the greenhouse, the high tunnel. Very, very important. If it gets above 95 degrees in there, your plants shut down. You'll end up with blossom rot or um, blossom drop on both your tomatoes and peppers. And those are both your cash crop if you're selling at the market. If you're trying to put up your own salsas or sauces, whatever, again, those are that's your cash crop right there. So you've got to be very mindful of that temperature. In in your ideal high tunnel setting, you want that temperature at 85 degrees. Now, my high tunnels, I have the roll-up sides, and, and even on the 100 foot long tunnel, I roll up the sides, I do it by myself, it's not that hard. With the roll-up sides, I can control that temperature even on a hot day, and I can keep it right around 85 degrees where the plants are at. So one of the tricks to cooling a high tunnel, and this, this is from Colorado State University and a researcher down there who is of course now retired, but he would just spray the top of the high tunnel with water or run drip tape on top of the high tunnel. And he'd run it for five minutes and that would cool the high tunnel by about 10 degrees and keep it cool for a couple of hours. So he didn't have to do that very often. Now I grow in the soil. And so I need to know what that, what that soil is. So I send out soil samples. And so one of the things that's real important that we don't think a lot about, but boron in nitrogen. And if you've got too little boron in the soil, you're gonna have poor pollen, pollination or poor quality pollen. And at the same time, if you have too much nitrogen in your high tunnel, you're using the wrong fertilizer, you're gonna also have um, uh, flavor problems and also you're gonna have poor quality pollen. Now you need pollinators in there and they should, use, they should start showing up and this is why it's important to have either roll up sides or your doors wide open or the windows all wide open so the pollinators can get in there, but they need to start showing up when you've got about five to 10% of your fruit flowering. So insect problems happens once in a while, but we're in a very dry state. And so there's not a lot of issues with, with insects, but neem oil is gonna be what you're gonna reach for and nothing, nothing heavier or more toxic. But please keep in mind that neem oil, even though it's listed as an Organic Materials Review Institute approved for organic crop production, it is not selective and it will take out your bees. Honeybees, they just die. They just die in a high tunnel. Don't, don't put honeybees in your high tunnel. Best bees for the job are your native bees and your bumblebees. And so you can actually buy bumblebees specifically for high tunnel production. My suggestion, <laughs> grow flowers, make sure you've got flowers in your high tunnel that are blooming from the start to the stop. And so I'm always, I always have like cosmos in there and zinnias, um, California poppies, but the, the zinnias and the cosmos hands down have been just bee magnets. Alyssum, alyssum attracts a whole host of really good insects that are predaceous on aphids. So set your flower gardens up and they can be just annual flower gardens, but set them up so that they're bringing in the good bugs and the good bugs will go after the bad ones. Okay, soil in the high tunnel. So fertilizer recommendations have been developed. I don't think they ever will. And part of it is because 
It's just so all, all over the board. It's different in a high tunnel and what you do outside, what you, what you do in your outside garden can absolutely be damaging inside a high tunnel. And you never ever want to put manures in your vegetable garden soil. And, and I'm going to include that for your outside garden too. So I know a lot of you are going, what? No manures. Here's why. They are unknown. They're totally unknown. Y yeah, you might know the animal that they came from or the species they came from, but you don't know what the nitrogen, the phosphorus, or the potassium levels are. And I, I guarantee you that they're all going to be really low, but the salts are going to be really, really high. And that's something you don't want to introduce into your garden soil is salt, high salt manures or high salt fertilizers. Because in a high tunnel, once you add salts or you introduce salts into the soil, getting them out, you either have to leach the soil and leach it so that that salt drops below the root zone, or you have to remove the soil or move the high tunnel. I have known people that have had to move their high tunnel. I've known several people that did because they thought, well, you know, a couple of truckloads of manure, that ought to do it. They just ruined the high tunnel doing that. The other thing with manures, and I'll get off my soapbox here, is they have pathogens. And if you're selling at a farmer's market, you cannot afford any pathogens. Even if you rinse those carrots or beets or whatever, you still have that risk of E. coli or salmonella or campylobacter or listeria. So you've got to be super, super careful when you're selling. And your food safety levels have got to be above and beyond. Even for your own family, they should be, you should be on top of that food safety issue. Manures also can carry parasites. I raise sheep and cattle. I, if I don't have to worm them, I don't. So whatever is in their manure, that's, that's where it's at. So I know they shed parasites, that's given, that's sheep. Their cattle, that's that's their job. So that never goes into any of my gardens. I at one time at full production, I had five thousand square foot of vegetable gardens, including the two high tunnels, and I never ever introduced manures into those soils. So you've got to take a very holistic approach to soil management. Leaf litter, you know, rake up the leaves. That's just amazing. If you can find someone in your area that's a lawn and garden person or lawn service and they're not using insect or herbicides or insecticides, then rake up those leaves and, and see if they'll just give them to you or you can go pick them up. Grass clippings, all of that is just awesome organic material to put into your garden soil and it's cheap, it's usually free, and it doesn't come with a lot of baggage like salts and weird stuff. So you've got to definitely take a holistic approach, kitchen scraps, coffee grounds, and coffee grounds filter and all that's just that's like putting gold into your soil. That's just a marvelous soil amendment. Um, okay, testing. Te you know get your soil tested. Send it out to a lab that's close to you. So don't send it out back east because it's cheap. Don't send it to Missouri because it's cheap. Don't use your co-op because they send it back east and I wouldn't trust the results. But find a lab like Kearney, Nebraska, Ward Labs. There's several labs in Wyoming. Um, I think there's a couple labs in Casper, I think. But you definitely wanna have the NPK EC, which is your electric conductivity or salt level and pH, those, those are really the important ones. So you wanna develop a fertilizer plan. You know, how are you going to amend your soils? Keep records, write this stuff down, put it in your iPad or tablet or whatever is your choice. Because the requirements change as those plants grow. And, and this is true whether it's inside high tunnel or it's out in your vegetable garden outside. Those soil, those fertility needs are going to change. If you're really having problems, especially in a high tunnel, you don't know what's going on. It's it's July. Take leaves from the middle of the plant. You know, measure top to bottom at the plant's 
30 inches tall, take them at 15 inches and send them down to Colorado State University lab and they will do leaf tissue testing for you. They get the results back very quickly. And at that point you can develop a, a fertilizer plan. And at this point, at that point in time, you're gonna to wanna to be able to spray on the fertilizer. So you gotta get something that, that you can, in a liquid form. And I will get on my miracle Grow soapbox here shortly, but that's gotta stay out of the high tunnel. It should stay out of your vegetable garden too. So nitrogen, so this is gonna be just a quick review, overview, or um, maybe it's new to you, but it's gonna be a quick review. So on that bag or bottle or box of fertilizer are three numbers. And for the most, for a lot of people, they're just mystery numbers, right? So the first number is gonna be nitrogen. And nitrogen is going, depends upon the nitrogen, but for the most part, it's gonna be anemonical nitrogen or urea kind of base nitrogen. And it's gonna cause those plants to grow really, really fast. And miracle Grow is notorious for this because their tomato formula has got like 18% nitrogen in it, which is way too high. So you're gonna have the biggest, best tomato plants in the whole neighborhood. You're gonna have that six foot tall tomato plant, you're gonna be amazed. But the tomatoes on it are gonna be far and few and they're gonna stay green and hard. And you're gonna have hard green tomatoes in October because they just aren't gonna ripen that nitrogen it ties up. Can we break to ask for questions when done? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah Amanda, you're gonna have to keep me on track because I, I'm very passionate about growing in high tunnels and vegetable gardens. And I, I could talk to you all day about this and I wouldn't get tired. So. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to grab my phone so I can keep track of time. Okay. Okay, so too much nitrogen. Big plants. Tomato plants, and you all may have experienced this, and this is why I don't like miracle Grow because it's too much nitrogen, way too much. Ties up that plant's ability to let that tomato become red. But the other important thing or bad thing is that it increases your insect problem. So you're going to have more aphids, a lot more aphids. You're going to have a lot more insect pressures because now this plant is really soft. It's succulent. It tastes really good to these insects. And so you just created a insect banquet. Sorry. So it can also alter the flavor of the fruit. You can end up with bitter fruit with it. So be very careful with that. Use a cover crop. I've done that in my high tunnel where I put down uh, oats one year. I grew oats in there and then I rototilled them in before they went to seed. I had really built up the organic material in the soil. I, the soil tilth was amazing. And 20% nitrogen, slow release. That's perfect. That was just perfect. Slow release is really the important thing because it, it was a little bit all season long, but it wasn't a big shot of nitrogen like what miracle Row does. Tomatoes can remove anywhere from 15 to 30 pounds of nitrogen per season. So they can take a lot out. So this in a high tunnel also, it because of the heat and, and it's a concentration in there, the organic material breaks down a lot faster. So you're always going to be thinking about, you know, collecting straw, collecting leaf, um, bags of leaves in the fall to put in there, um, grass clippings, you know, as long as they haven't used uh, herbicides on their lawn, grass clippings are amazing. Leaves, all that stuff. Phosphorus, needed for roots, flowers, and fruit development. And this is one of the most important minerals that we use for vegetable gardening because flowers and fruits, that's what we're going for. Okay, can increase the soil pH over time. So you've got to be very careful. Again, just like nitrogen, it can cause some vegetables to become bitter. And vegetables typically remove 10 to 15 pounds of phosphorus per year. 
but it also needs nitrogen. So these two hold hands. So they've got to have them both together. Potassium. This is one where tomatoes need potassium, but potassium is extremely salty. So this is also your potash, your murate of potash, and it's very, very salty. So you've got to be very careful with it and, and just sort of meter it out slowly because uh, a lot will just cause problems in your soil. But you know, you've for all those that you like to grow tomatoes and you've cut a tomato open and you open it up and the inside is white, the core is white. It's a potassium deficiency typically. And also if your tomatoes aren't perfectly red, but they're kind of an orangey kind of model looking, that can also be a potassium deficiency. Okay. Organic matter. Because of the higher temperatures, and it's concentrated, right? It's a concentrated environment in there. You're gonna go through organic matter faster. So anywhere from one and a half to 3% loss per growing season. So that's why you've gotta to continue to add it. Your own kitchen scraps, your, um, again, no manure in a bag, no cow, sheep in a bag, no mushroom compost. Mushroom compost is just straw or, um, wood shavings and horse manure. No, don't put that in there. That You don't know what the NPK is. You don't know what the EC is, the salt level. You don't know what the pH is. So you're putting a big unknown into a vegetable garden. And vegetables want a more acidic soil to grow in. They want a pH of around six and a half, all the way as low as five and a half. Your potatoes are gonna be happy at five and a half pH, but you start, ooching above seven and a half and you start having nutrient problems. So you gotta, again, be very careful what you add to your soil, keeping in mind that what vegetables want to grow best. So in a perfect world, you're gonna put down an inch of organic material and rototill it in. Don't use wood ash. Don't use wood ash or barbecue ash. <laughs> so when, when great, great, great grandma, pioneer grandma used to make lye soap, well, where'd she come up with lye? She wasn't hauling it with her. She was making her own lye. And so she would take wood ash and she would run water through the wood ash. And what came out was lye. And lye has got a pH of 14. And vegetables want their soil at six and a half in a perfect world. So be very careful. You can do a little bit of wood ash. A little goes a long, long ways, but you don't want to be adding a lot of it. So there's a book out there called Lasagna Gardening. Does not work here in the West because of our soil pH. That was written by someone who's down in Georgia or down in the deep South. And it doesn't work here. Her whole premise was, you know, adding wood, wood ash and newspaper and, and layering this whole thing and growing on top of this crazy layer. But you don't want to add wood ash ever. And if you do, it should be just spread out really, really thin. Okay, watering. Here's another myth. Uh, and that the greenhouse should be humid. No, it, that works fine in a botanical conservatory where they're growing banana plants. And I guarantee you, even their banana plants are having bacterial and fungal problems and they're fighting those constantly. But you wanna keep your plants on the dry side and the humidity should be kept as low as possible. Excess humidity is gonna breed insects and disease problems. And once you start getting those problems in, trying to bring it back into balance is difficult. Very, very difficult. So the drier you can keep your greenhouse or your high tunnel, your hoop house, the healthier your plants are going to be. And, and all diseases in, the high, in that situation are become worse with the humidity. So watering, I just, you can kind of see it in the background there on the slide behind me. I've got a very simple drip tape system. PVC, a couple manifolds, and a timer, filter and a timer. Your timer is your 
best employee. Don't, don't skip on the timer. Don't skip it. Don't skip on it. Get a timer. And my timer comes on about 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. And then it shuts off a couple hours later. And it's reliable. I'm not. I'll turn the water on and then I go multitask and do something else. And I'll go to what time it is. And it will be like, oh, my heck, you know, oh, my heck. And, and so I flooded something. So that timer prevents a lot of problems. You can, it also, the timer also allows you to go on a vacation or leave on the weekend and your garden is being watered reliably, goes on, comes off. You're not worrying about the neighbor, his neighborhood kid doing it. You know, you, you don't want to come home to a wet, soggy garden of dead plants. So buy a timer. Um, drip tape. I'm a big fan of drip tape. There's a company out there called dripworks.com and they have just a plethora of great products. Most of the time you're gonna to have to mail order this. I've never found it in any of the, the big box stores here in Cheyenne. And so and mail ordering is pretty easy. So even in your outside garden, you wanna keep the water on the ground. If you're throwing the water into the air with an oscillating sprinkler, you're watering weeds, you're introducing the opportunity for more disease and insects, both inside and outside. If you do, the only time I've ever seen to use overhead sprinklers on top of the high tunnel to cool it. So now you're outside spraying the top of the high tunnel to cool it down. But don't turn your high tunnel into a Petri dish. And it's real easy to do. And I've even in mine where I have the roll up sides, if I don't clean up underneath my tomato plants, I end up with botrytis down there, which is that fuzzy gray mold. Okay, watering, this is the drip system. Easy, 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 easy. There's my filter. There's a manifold with a valve. I've, I've since changed this system and it's now every foot on center. And so I, it gives me a lot of flexibility and options. I don't have to run drip tape on every foot. I can shut one, I can skip them like I've done here. This is skipped, I just turn it off, and turn it on, skip, I've skipped one. So it gives me a lot of flexibility. It helps with that rotation too, because you want to rotate constantly. Every year you're putting plants in a new place. So it, um, again, if you can keep that humidity down and keep the air circulation up, you're going to have a lot better luck with keeping the bad bugs out. And again, if you do have insect issues, you've got to spray. Neem oil is your best choice, but again, it's very non-selective. You can, and, you, and again, I encourage you to plant a pollinator island, but also put some trap crops in there. And those trap crops, and this comes from some trials at the Missouri State University, and they used winter squash, um, Hubbard and uh, buttercup squash, and they pulled off the Western striped cucumbers away from the plants they really wanted to save. When you plant your winter squash, you know, I always put black plastic down on the soil first, my drip irrigations underneath that black plastic. That way I'm not weeding because I got enough to do. I don't need more weeding. And I just let the plants go wherever they want to on the black plastic outside. And if they get these guys, I don't care because it's not going to impact my yields. Collards, you can grow collards. Mustard will pull cabbage, butterfly, and flea beetles. There is no control for flea beetles. You will never get an upper hand on them. They are just everywhere. So plant trap crops instead. So pull, pull the bad bugs out to where you want them, outside the high tunnel or outside your garden. And, and that just makes your life easier. That way you're not using insecticides. Buckwheat's another trap crop. It also makes a good green manure. You can just plow it. So green manure is, is a crop that you're growing like oats or wheat or vetch or buckwheat. And you don't, you let it flower, but you don't let it go to seed. And then you rototill it in and it adds a tremendous amount of organic material and slow release NPK. 
Okay. Barberia vulgaris. This is a dead end trap crop. This you have to buy seeds online. Seeds can be a little challenging to find. But these, these guys attract the female cabbage white butterflies. Because dang, if that's not a hard one to control, I don't know what it is. But this Barbaria vulgaris will pull those away. And that's pretty cool. Hey, well, let's talk a little bit about some of the crops to grow. And I'm just going to focus on the uh, the cash crops, the ones that are high value. So tomatoes, real important. This is both inside and outside. You want to water, start watering your tomatoes or your vegetable garden when it's warmed up. So it should be warm outside and you want to start maybe 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning and water for however long your garden needs to be watered. But the important thing with that is that it reduces that cracking. So we've all got, you know, looked at those tomatoes and go, ah, that's a beautiful tomato. And you come back the next day and it's got a big crack on it. That has everything to do with water and when you water. And so, and the other thing is that when you're starting to have a lot of red fruit on there, you want to kind of back off the water a little bit. So that increases that sugar level, that bricks level. The fruit might be smaller, but it's going to be sweeter. And always, always um, keep the water off the plants and on the ground. So high tunnel too hot. So I'm, I have a thermometer, a remote sensing thermometer inside my high tunnel, the remotes that tells me what the temperature is in, inside my house. So I can just glance at my inside temperature gauge and go, oh, it's already 75 degrees. I need to go roll up the sides. So a high tunnel that's too hot is going to cause misshaped fruit. Blossom end rot is going to be something you got to be mindful of in a high tunnel too because of water problems. Too hot, too dry, too wet, and so blossom end rot. High soil or water salt levels, your EC levels. Again, if that's too high, that's going to um, also be a contributing cause to blossom end rot. Possibly too little calcium, but I think that's a lot more myth than reality. Wyoming soils are very high in calcium to begin with. And it's not ever a mineral that I worry about, but is it bioavailable to the plant? And so a lot of people go, well, I put eggshells in my soil. They're not bioavailable. They're great organic material and they break down over time slowly, but they're not bioavailable right then and there when they're needed. If you do need to use calcium in your high tone, I'd be really I'd be raising an eyebrow over that, but um, do get greenhouse grade calcium. Real important because you want that to be able to break down and become bioavailable right away. Okay, again, relative humidity can cause off flavor, concentric cracking like that guy up there. Um, again, high temperature, high humidity, watering at the wrong time. You've really got to water, again, when, that, when the plants are warm. And an important thing with that is that that skin is tight in the morning. And if you're watering when it's cold and the skin is tight, that's, the plant has no place to put the water so the skin just tears or cracks. And so watering when the plant is warmed up, that skin is more flexible and stretchy. And so you're gonna have fewer cracking problems. And then zip ring, that's this, where you look at the bottom of the plant and you go, wow, that's unique looking. That's when the anthers become attached to the ovary wall. And that's a, that's a function of cool weather. So that's gonna be something that, you know, I try to get my, Tomatoes in March, if I can, April, and this can be a problem. Okay. Again, radial cracking. It's always disappointing to see that because you get, you know, you just cut that off and that's just waste. Develops from the stem scar, may develop fungal problems caused by wide swings in moisture. So the wide swings in moisture, again, that's blossom and rot. Set, that's a scenario for that. So that's why that timer is so important because it comes on and it goes off when it's supposed to. 
and it's not going to cause those wide swings. Okay, now <laughs> I just told you to keep the humidity low and it tomatoes kind of like it, you know. Anyway, some research done at Colorado State University in their high tunnels. So I tried this up here too. And all I did was just put, this is floating row cover or spun bond, it's a non-woven fabric. You can use this for insect exclusion or in the fall, you can use it to kind of keep a, a frost barrier. So I put it up at the base of my tomatoes and it increased the humidity just where it needed to be at the base of those tomatoes. So the humidity kind of went up internally through the branches, which had me a little concerned about botrytis and a few other things, but it kept the tomatoes warmer at night. And that's another really important thing to getting those tomatoes to turn red is the night temperatures need to be around 75 degrees. So this floating row cover kept a little bit warmer where it was supposed to be, increased the humidity ever so slightly, but not enough to cause disease. But I was able to harvest two weeks earlier and I was growing beefsteak tomatoes in there. And beefsteak tomatoes in Wyoming are really difficult because they need 110 days. We do not have 110 day growing season, even in a high tunnel, it's pushing it. So this helped me harvest two weeks earlier, which I, I was pretty tickled about. I was happy. Hey, so getting a jump on the season, you can start a lot of stuff like spinach, Asian greens, other cool season stuff, transplant it into the high tunnel and transplant in September for December harvest. You can transplant in February for March, April or May harvest. So it's, it extends, that's just how we extend the season. There's also other cool ways of getting in there in February and getting things growing so that you are got a harvest in, uh, on Memorial weekend, which that would be amazing. But you do have greater insect pressures and we don't know why. I've seen high tunnels that go year round and they have an aphid problem that's just, they just can't control. However, <laughs> your plants like spinach and Asian greens, your mustards and collards, they're gonna be sweeter because they've had a little bit of coolness, a little bit of frost. And so that brings up their bricks levels. This is where you have to hand water. You water less frequently, be very careful hand watering, keep yourself on a schedule. Floating roll covers or sheets or something to protect the plants, you're gonna cover them above, but you don't want them to touch the plants. So you just literally want them kind of draped over something, a frame. And that's, that's a whole nother lecture, sorry, <laughs> but growing inside in the winter. Um, soil temperature, hugely important. Um, I just have an inexpensive meat thermometer and I, I went digital. So I have a little digital one that I go out there, but your tomatoes want their soil temperature at 85 degrees. So to use your peppers, your cucumbers, your green beans, eggplants, they all want warm soil, watermelon, cantaloupe, warm soil. Those are all desert plants. And when you think about where the big growing areas for those plants are at, Florida, Georgia, Texas, Arizona, Southern California, what do they all have in, in common other than long growing season? The soil is warm, 85 degrees. That is your target. So I use black plastic, even in the high tunnel to heat that soil up, your plants will grow faster. They'll be hardier. You'll have be harvesting sooner. So <laughs> you, can, you can be a geeky gardener, geeky horticulturist and uh, get a soil thermometer and take the temperature of the soil, but 85 is your target degree. So getting a jump on the season, this is where season extension is. This was in February, um, Scott and Jackie are at 6,500 feet here in Laramie County. This is what their high tunnel looked like in February. And they had tomato plants coming out the top. This is the flexible cattle panel. They were growing all their tomatoes up the cattle panel. And that's pretty remarkable for February. But they had tomatoes to sell in, in uh, the first market in June. Okay, so some rules. 
several management strategies for pest control, disease control, but your number one rule is going to increase the air circulation and decrease the humidity, always. This is rule number one. Increase air circulation, decrease the humidity. Don't wanna use overhead watering unless you're trying to cool the top of the high tunnel, even in your outside vegetable garden. Keep the water on the ground. Sanitation is everything. I have seen shop vacs in high tunnels. I have dragged a shop vac through my high tunnel, but sanitation is really important. You keep the, the dead plants, the dead leaves, and whatever falls off, keep it cleaned up. I, I encourage you to grow your own plants. Tomato plants are easy peasy to grow. Peppers are a little more persnickety, but all of this stuff is easy to grow and transplant in there. But inspect your new plants before they go into high tunnel. And that means turning them upside down and looking underneath the leaves because that's where those bugs like to hang out is on the bottom side. Not all fertilizers work in a high tunnel. Do not use miracle Grow in your high tunnel. Don't use it in your outside garden either. It's just too high in nitrogen. You're gonna have a lot of problems. So make your own fertilizer, make your own fertilizer. And here's the recipe. You're gonna take a five gallon bucket, fill it with water. You're gonna take one pound of alfalfa pellets. You're gonna throw the alfalfa pellets in there. You let the alfalfa pellets soak anywhere from eight to 24 hours. You really don't wanna go over 24 because it starts to ferment and smell bad. It's still usable, but then you're going to add one cup of sugar. I also like to throw in some, and the sugar is added at the last, just before you use it. I also put in fish emulsion and just follow the instructions on the bottle for that one. I think it's like two tablespoons to a gallon. I stir it all up and one cup per plant per week. I make my own fertilizer and I'll tweak it depending upon what I see the needs are, what the testing tells me I need to add, but make your own fertilizer. This is inexpensive. Alfalfa comes in 50 pound bags that will last you for several growing seasons and you're in control. Okay, um, kind of covered that, keep records. Truly keep records. You want to know what your garden map is, you know, where those peppers and tomatoes are at and the carrots and green beans. So keep a map so you can do some good rotation because you want to rotate those crops every year. I always weigh or count everything that comes out of my high tunnel. So I know what is being successful and what isn't being successful. So your tomato plants, for example, should be giving you 10 pounds of fruit per plant. 10 pounds of fruit per plant. And I have the same benchmark for my peppers and they should be giving me back 10 pounds per, per plant. So keep track of all that. And then what worked and what didn't work. So keep track of all that. So more information, Mississippi State University and Penn State, they've got some great information and some great instructors out there. Colorado State, um, Mark down there is doing a lot of great work. So some local information. And again, my thanks to Karen Panter who taught me a lot and is now retired and probably out having fun and enjoying things. So with that, I am going to stop sharing. Oh, and by the way, those are artichokes growing over there. <laughs> Cucumbers. I got 60 pounds of cucumbers from this area right here, 60 pounds. And I wanna say I got about 20 pounds. And I got, I got more like 30 pounds of watermelon, 30 pounds of watermelon, 60 pounds of cucumbers. <laughs> yeah. Hey, questions. Any questions? Uh, for like the bucket, you mean? No. Oh. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just I just use a regular old five gallon. Sorry. <laughs> okay, nothing special. Yeah, I my whole goal is is this has got to make money for me, and it can't cost me a lot of money. I got to beat grocery store prices, right? We want to beat the grocery store prices. I use about a dollar a day in electricity to pump water for my vegetable garden, so. I, I keep track of, I know how much money I've bought seeds. So I spend like $125 in seeds and potatoes and all that sort of stuff. And I know how much I spend in, in electricity. So I keep track, keep track of that. Especially if you want to sell at the farmer's market. And, and again, yes, absolutely. I did record this by the way. I will have my one of the admins edit it and make it get, get some of the beginning stuff out and I'll send it to you guys and my slideshow. My slideshow is actually twice as long as what I presented today. So you're gonna get some bonus material with it. But yeah, I'll definitely share that with you guys because I think this is important. I want everybody to be successful. Yeah. So uh, we have a link, uh, so resources and links on our website, washakeecd.com. And we have a, a bunch of resources uploaded, um, not too many videos, but a lot of barnyard and backyard articles. And we'll also be uh, placing all of our presenter materials that are shared with us um, on that section as well on our website. So okay. if you missed writing something down, you'll have access to that. Well, Catherine, uh, if you can hear me, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate that and all the information you shared with us. Hey, this is, I, I teach this class for the Master Gardener program here and it's three hours. And I, still don't, <laughs> I still don't cover it all, so. Yeah. yeah, well, you did a great job, thank you. Okay, thank you. Questions are easy to get a hold of, so. All right, sounds good. All right. You guys have, have fun. Bye. Bye.